Good morning, everybody. Does anybody have real-time access to NCIC? No? Right now? Okay, my name is Dave Smith. <laughs> no. So I'm Mark Fletcher. People call me uh, Fletch. Um, I'm the chief architect for public safety solutions at Avaya. Avaya is a telecommunications company who manufactures systems. A lot of our systems are actually out in the 911 centers today. Um, it's in the back end. You don't always see us on the desktop because we don't do the CAD applications. But in fact, our solutions are uh, in the back end of quite a bit. So Patrick asked me to add a slide into the presentation on who is Fletch, just so people know who I am. Um, I've been at all of these events around the country, but this is one of my favorites because I am a, uh, a hometown Jersey boy. So in the early 80s, I actually learned uh, how public safety 12-hour night shifts worked. That's me circa 1980-81 up at the Sparta Police Department. Uh, in the early 90s, I learned telecommunications, started climbing telephone poles for a living. And uh, in the new millennium, I'm putting all of that together, uh, telecommunications uh, and public safety, dealing with that product line at Avaya, making sure that we're represented at the government level, making sure the industry is represented. Uh, I sit on various committees at NINA, ENA, APCO, and on the FCC. I want to talk real quick about a, a problem that relates to public safety and just raise your awareness to this. Um, back last year on December 1st, Carrie Hunt Dunn died because of a single digit. Now, you may have heard of this in the, in the newspapers. But she met her estranged husband in a Marshall, Texas hotel for a meet uh, and exchange with the children. And during that, her ex-husband brutally attacked her and stabbed her, allegedly, 49 times in the hotel room. This was in front of her three children. And her nine-year-old daughter actually tried to call 911, not once, not twice, not three times, but four times. But none of those calls went through. And the reason for that is that um, she had to dial 9 for an outside line. If you're staying in this hotel, you have to dial 9, 911. Um, yet when we're brought up, the things that we learn is that 911 is the number for emergencies. And there's a petition out there at change.org, Carrie's Law, that's actually raised this at the federal level. There's almost a half a million signatures on that petition right now. Uh, Avaya has been extremely supportive, and we've been kind of championing this at the FCC level for Hank Hunt on behalf of Kerry. Um, it's something you should be aware of, and as public safety officials, it's something you should help make the general public aware of. So getting back to why we're here today, let's look at the current state of emergency services. It's really voice call routing that's static and based on really a limited number of variables. Primarily, we've got Annie and Allie, or phone number and location information that's displayed to us. Sometimes we have class of service. We know if it's a pay phone, if there are any of those existing, or a PBX phone, or residential. And we get some basic account information that relates to the billing address information. And as we talk about, we look at mobile telephones, voice over IP, and business telephones, that phone number doesn't always, or the account information isn't always equal to where the um, person is. So the point here is the existing 911 infrastructure is built around these three basic concepts. And this was first noted when we became nomadic and mobile with our cellular phones. All of a sudden, back in the mid-'80s, telephone numbers didn't have an address, a fixed point on the planet. And this was a huge problem, which is why phase one, phase two mobile phone technology has been rolled out. But now with voice over IP, with business telephone systems, just yesterday, for example, I was a remote worker at my house. I work out of my house during the morning. In the afternoon, I was on my cell phone, still with my business telephone number, and when I got here last night, my location was here, still with the same business telephone number. So my location changed 
to three distinct points. One of those, a very mobile point, and I could have dialed 911 at any of those times. But without the right technology on the enterprise side and the PSAP side, no one's going to know where I am. And if nobody knows where I am, you can't do your job. And this is why the system today is just horribly broken. Fortunately, the future state fixes this, and that's next generation 911. And what it really is, it, it's about additional data being passed to public safety. It's more than just a telephone number that you take and look up in Verizon's database. It's actual information from the endpoint um, that, that provides some, some additional information. Like if you look at a business, it could be floor plans, it could be specific location information, it could be information coming out of an enabled smart device. Smart devices know exactly where you are. Why? Because they don't just rely on GPS. In this room, GPS doesn't do anything, but they rely on ass assisted GPS, radio triangulation of the access points and radio towers that they see, not are necessarily attached to, but they can see them. And there is a service out there called Skyhook that the applications actually look to that can do very, very accurate location discovery. The problem is, is there's no way for that device to talk to 911 other than a voice call. And I can't transmit information on a voice call. If I do have information, there's all kinds of apps that can be deployed in the Peace app. This app here is actually an interesting one deployed in Switzerland. It actually will look at a video call and based on hand placement, help, help to decode American Sign Language. It's not 100% accurate, but it lets somebody get the gist of what's going on. So again, there are a ton of data feeds that are out there, video feeds. There's IP video cameras in every building, every bank, every public space. This is information that can be exposed to public safety. There's environmental data. What's the number, who's a dispatcher or runs a dispatch center? What's the number one 911 call that you get in your center? Would it be a 911 hang up? Um, probably. We get a lot more um, calls that come in for other jurisdictions. Okay. But you'll, you'll agree that a 911 hang up is a, is a major piece of your 911 call. So a 911 call from this hotel. 911, what's your emergency? Hello. Hello, 911, hello. Somebody just called 911 from the Marriott, again. Hey, can you swing by there when you get a chance? Make sure everything's okay? Well, let's change that up. 911, hello, 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 nobody's there. Oh, look, the additional data light is flashing, telling me I've got additional data available from the enterprise. What's going on? Hmm, we have an ambient temperature of 225 degrees. Is that a little different than a normal hang-up call? Right? So this is where additional data can really help dispatchers make those decisions that are critical to life safety. And we'll show you a couple other examples. Another great one is, is, a, is a bank. The teller hits the silent alarm button under the counter, generates an alarm into the PSAP, whether it's through central station or direct. That by itself, Okay, it's a bank alarm, we need to respond. But nine times out of 10, oh, I pulled the last 20 out of the drawer by mistake, I bumped the button, whatever. It's typically a non-event. But that same event coming in, and then, oh, we'll click here for the video. I can actually link into the bank video. Hey, there's Kenny Milano in the lobby again, making a withdrawal with a ski mask and a shotgun. Again. So again, this additional data is really the value behind next generation 911. It's not OMG, send popo right away, you know, text messaging. That's a piece of next generation, but it's much, much more than that. The industry factors that are influencing this, well, there is state, regional, local consortiums. We heard several people, my old county, you know, consolidation. Why are you doing that? 
to save expenses, right? Provide a more robust environment to a wider service area. There is some legislation that's coming out, not strong enough because the states aren't required to fund this properly. And we've had several discussions. There's an FCC report that comes out every year that's just disgusting. And the number of states that don't report and the number of states that don't contribute those funds back to 911. It costs a lot of money to maintain peace apps. It costs a lot of money to put in this new technology for four dispatchers or two dispatchers or one dispatcher. But if I have a group of 20 or 30 or 40, sure, those centers can afford that. But Sussex County doesn't have a 40 seat 911 center. So how do you handle that? Through consolidation, the virtual 911 center. It's great that you're building a building and you're centrally locating, but you don't have to do that. You can leave people where they are if you need to. And that's the beauty about next generation 911. Because the technology that we've got today, first 911 call was when? Anybody? February 18th, 1968 a long time. Basically that technology has been upgraded in the early 80s where we added caller ID and then later where we tied that to a street address. Other than that, there's been no update in the PSAP capabilities. You've got basic information. I used to dispatch up in Sparta. I went up there, my buddy who I started with is still there, just built a brand new center. There's, when I was there, it was two positions staffed by one. Now it's six positions staffed by four. But I went in there, and with all the modern technology that they have, the same thing still happened. Somebody dialed 911, the phone rang, somebody answered it, and dispatched help to where they needed to go. That job has not changed since I was there in 1980. Now, they got a lot more computers to help with that. They don't have to look at the old teletype. All I had was a big 3270 green screen to do DMV lookups on and paper punch cards. Now they've got CAD, they've got GIS and mapping, they've got all toys to play with, but the job is still the same. That phone rang, somebody needs help, and they need to figure out who needs to go help them and how to get them there. So the 911 network today, the design of this, it assumes that a phone number equals a location. Back in the day, that happened. That's what it was. Phone numbers weren't mo nomadic or mobile. It was a simple architecture, location was static, and there was no mobility of devices. And that's why 911 worked for a long, long time without any problems. Cellular started to change that. The reality today with Vonage, cable modems, and voice over IP, and business telephone systems letting people work remotely. I'm up in Ringwood, New Jersey. I work at home. My PBX is in, is in Colorado. And the trunks that I go out on when I make a phone call are actually in a data center in Ohio. And none of that's attached to the New Jersey 911 network. That's a problem. There are ways to solve that. But telephone numbers no longer equal locations. There are complex network technologies, and now users are highly nomadic. And their mobility isn't even predictable. I can be anywhere at any time. Look at yesterday, right? So this is what creates a huge problem that can't be solved with a legacy 911 network. The future is with standards. Now standards was actually a battle not too long ago. NINA, the National Emergency Number Association, introduced what's called the NINA I3 specific specification, which was their 08003 spec. When they announced that, when they announced that they were going to announce that, did you know that Entrato came in and challenged that spec 
with lawyers to try to stop that from being promulgated and enacted. Intrado does your current database for probably 80% of the US. Next Gen 911 eliminates the alley dip. If they're the ones that own the alley databases, there's a lot of revenue on the table. So they actually tried to challenge and stop Next Gen 911 or actually put in their model of Next Gen 911, which basically was their alley dip delivered via IP. But it wasn't really the spirit of Next Gen. Fortunately, they lost that battle and backed down. But why do we need to move to Next Gen 911? Why does Sussex County, an area that I use as an example because I know the county, I'm glad you guys are in the room today. Why does Sussex County, farmland, need next generation 911? Well, it's increased capabilities. It's reduced and controlled costs. It's increased capacity. And by increased capacities, what I mean is, is that today when you have a mass call event because of a some type of disaster. Everybody remember Hurricane Sandy, right? Who was at a phone service for a week? Pretty much everybody, including 911. Commissioner Pai, when he was doing his Superstorm Sandy field hearings, had read one of my blogs and actually quoted me in, in, his, in his speech. And what he said was, how come when we had mass call events because of Sandy, our 911 infrastructure was down? Yet I could pick up my phone if I had dial tone, and I could call my airline, I could call my bank, or I could call anybody else. And I wouldn't be routed to the call center that was closest to me. I was routed to the call center that was operational and could handle my call. Because even in those industries, their call centers here in New Jersey were down as well. So why isn't our 911 network built on the same architecture that our banking telecommunications, that the airline communications, that our retail communications are built on? How can that be? Because our public safety infrastructure is built, believe it or not, with multiple single points of failure. We don't use the technology available. Why? Because it was built in 1968. And that's why we need to increase capacity, not by adding more seats, but by adding more virtual resources into the environment, effectively increasing our capabilities. So more stuff at less cost is what it boils down to. The other reason to move is capabilities, GIS, mapping, CAD integration, geospatial call routing. What's the big event every year up in Sussex County? Farm and Horse Show. Somebody puts a trailer there for emergency services, right? So let's talk about a concept, geofencing. The fairgrounds has got a very specific area. If somebody dials 911 from within that area, and I've got an EOC trailer on site, why not route the call right to that EOC trailer? Why does that have to go to a PSAP to get routed to the trailer? It's geospatial routing. Plus, we can start taking in SMS, real-time text, and multimedia, video images, <coughs> data, right? and making decisions based on that. So less costs and more cool stuff. Finally, costs, PSAP consolidations. Again, exactly what they're doing up in Sussex County. They're taking, they're building a new center, and they're saying, you know what? I can do this for your township for a fifth of what it's costing you today. Cool stuff, 
more staff. Which is probably the number one problem. So this is the way 911 operates today for those of you that don't understand the technology. There's a 911 tandem that processes the 911 calls. I send it down on specialized 911 trunks to the center. They peel off the phone number and do a dip in the, the database, the alley database. That call needs to go to another agency. What they do, they don't transfer it to the agency. They actually send the call back to the 911 tandem. And the 911 tandem now sends that call to the new agency where they do a database dip. And they start their call recording. Oh, that needs to go to a third agency. The same process happens again. Why? Because there's no interagency connectivity. The interagency connectivity is done at the selective router. So in, in this case, what I've done is, is I've gone through and I've now got three disparate pieces of data associated with that 911 call, even though it's a recording of the call and, and a transfer. That timeline could be very critical, especially when you're looking at a potentially misrouted call and people are looking at li liability. But important details are left behind. What if it was a shooting event and there was very specific audio that was on the first call event? How do I correlate all that information back with the terminating agency? Very difficult to put all that together after the fact. This is where a new concept, a new disruptive concept in public safety is coming out that's called collaborative conferencing. And again, we're taking functionality from a commercial corporate environment and we're using it for public safety. So let's look at how that, this would work, this transfer would work in NextGen 911. I've got a call that's going to come into my center and with that call, I've got associated bits of data. It might be text, it might be additional data, whatever. It's additional data that's coming in to the cloud, into the solution. This could be a county, it could be a consortium of counties. It's just the network environment. That information is examined and a decision is made, I need to bring in this particular call taker from this particular agency. And I now bring in session recording to where I'm capturing all of the information, the audio, the data that's coming in, and if additional resources are required, whether it's poison control, social services, language line, instead of transferring the call, I bridge these people in on the conference bridge. How many of you have been in a conference call before? Everybody has. Oh wow, this is really interesting stuff. Hey Kenny, you need to jump on this web conference and see this. This is amazing stuff. He joins the web conference, the multimedia conference. Everything that everybody else sees is right in front of him. I don't have to store it. I don't have to transport it. It's there when he gets there. This is the model. Now where this conference is held is entirely up to the network. Let me give you a use case that's a pretty common one that shows you where this can be valuable and where agencies beyond public safety on the fringe can actually be valuable. I'm driving down Route 80, I'm going too fast, and I flip over in the median. I got a high-speed rollover, wasn't wearing my seatbelt, and I'm in a fairly new GM motor vehicle. OnStar picks that up. OnStar picks that up. An automatic crash notification knows that I've crashed. It knows my body weight, 205 pounds. And uh, it knows that I wasn't wearing my seatbelt. And it knows that there's a crash zone impact of the dashboard and, and a very high delta V, 60 to 0. They could take that information and they could actually model based on historical data. There's probably severe lower leg trauma. 80% possibility of that. 
<clears throat> so that information goes into the emergency services IP network, where the systems now start to look at that data and make some decisions. Okay, the location of that call was Route 94 out in Hampton. Great, no problem. I, need, I now know the department that handles that. That call is going to go to the brand new Sussex County EOC that we're building. And they're going to get all that data, not audibly over the 10 digit line like OnStar gives it to them today. They're going to get an automatic alert electronically, motor vehicle accident, here's where it is, here's the projected injuries. Great. They're going to start their dispatch procedures. But guess, guess what? Who's also attached to the ESI net or who can be attached? Somebody right up the road, Newton Hospital. And let's pretend that Newton's got a helicopter. <laughs> Based on that information, lower extremity, massive injuries, we know we need Dr. Bob off the golf course. We know we need a surgical suite and maybe we have the ability of dispatching air med because we know we're probably going to need it. At least we're going to get that crew on standby. Or the paramedics. But again, it's dispatch recommendations being made or being readied based on the incident information. It's information that the dispatcher is making anyway we're just automating this by providing them with data and automated systems that can make these correlations. As areas build their individual ESI nets, now is when they can start collaborating together. So I talked to the folks at Sussex County a couple of months ago. I came up not to sell them my stuff. They're not ready for my stuff. But just to talk to them about Next Gen 911, I gave them much of this presentation. And what I recommended to them was, you guys need to build your county ESI net. Don't wait for the state of New Jersey. And then when you build that, whether you have adjoining counties building ESI nets and the state connecting it, whether the state builds a network and the states connect to each other, it doesn't really matter because it's, it's like, not the, but like the internet, which is a network of networks. You don't need to know what my mail server is to send me an email. You put an email into FletcherM at avaya.com, the internet knows how to get to my mail server. My mail server knows how to get that email to me because of the internet, because of a network of networks. When we start building ESI net nodes, whether it's town, county, or state level, when they're all built to a standards-based protocol, NINA I3, they'll all internetwork together. And that's the beauty, really, of next generation 911. How do I get there? I build this new architecture. I'm building new PSAPs, no problem. But what do I do with my legacy PSAPs? Do I buy a PSAP that is next-gen ready or next-gen capable? No. If you're buying a new PSAP, you buy a next-generation PSAP, flat out. That's the only decision. Otherwise, whatever you buy, you're going to be thrown out in five years. If you've got old PSAP technology, there's a model, in the, in the, in the NINA model, there are two functional elements. One is called a legacy PSAP gateway, which is a gateway that lets legacy PSAPs talk to the new networks, converts old to new. And there's a legacy network gateway. Anybody want to guess what that does? Converts legacy networks into the new PSAPs. So whether you're a carrier or whether you're a PSAP, there's a way by putting a single box at the edge of the next-gen networks for legacy 
networks to attach. Simple. It's part of the backbone. Enterprise networks, businesses, hotels like this one, these are very problematic for today's 911. Avaya is a huge player in the commercial PBX space. This is a big problem, and, and we're helping address this. So what next generation 911 will allow me to do, I've already got the magic box that goes inside the corporate network that tracks the location of the phones, that provides localized alerting. Hey, room 525 just dialed 911. Here's a floor plan of where room 525 is. I already make this stuff. A lot of corporations, not a, not a lot, some corporations already have deployed this. Not enough have, and that's why there's still a problem. But that information exists. I've got a very rich data store inside PBX networks or commercial networks. I've got no mechanism to give that data to 911 today. But what I can do in the future, I'll be able to actually transmit the data real time. But you know what? That's going to be a few years. And I'm not quite ready to sit back and wait for that to happen. So I came up with something that's called next generation 911 over the top of the legacy network, delivering that data today. How many of you heard of a company called Smart 911? Smart 911 is a company that provides a service to PSAPs where they aggregate additional data from external sources and then they present that information when a 911 call is delivered. Now for you and me as private citizens, Smart 911 is free. It doesn't cost us a thing. And I recommend you go to smart911.com and set up a personal safety profile for yourself. Because what happens is, wherever you are in the US, from a registered telephone number or device, if you dial 911 and your call ends up at a Smart 911 enabled center, and there are about 1,400 of them in the US right now, in addition to all your Annie Alley data that shows up on a regular cellular call, your smart 911 profile pops up. So Washington DC Unified Communications Center is a smart 911 PSAP. Brentwood, Tennessee is a smart 911 PSAP. When I was at Nina down in Brentwood, one of the, uh, the Brentwood PSAP was on the PSAP tour. I went into the PSAP and as a demo, I dialed 911 from my cell phone. And what popped up on the dispatcher screen, in addition to all the alley ante, was my smart 911 profile. Now this is a family profile, so I'm on there, my wife's there, my daughter's there, medical information for each of us. There's pictures. So if my daughter is missing, she's 16, that could very likely happen. PD has got a picture of her immediately. There's information about my residence here, my medications, what vehicles should be in my driveway, where I work, where my home address, everything I want 911 to know when I call 911. Now, although a lot of that information is not relevant to Brentwood, Tennessee, especially my home address, my medications, my emergency contacts, there's a lot of information that's relevant. If Ringwood ever gets a decent PSAP, they would actually be able to see this in my profile. And that's just a real simple floor plan of my house. Not that I live in a huge mansion. It's a simple two-story home. Bedrooms are on the second floor. Furnaces in the crawl space. The important piece of data on this map, right here. Office area is in the detached garage. Resident works from home. Why is that important? I might pass out, dial 911 during the day. I might be the only person home. They go to my front door, they're not going to get an answer. Again, additional data. 
That's what Next Generation 911 is about, getting this kind of information from the public into the centers. So again, a vice presence in public safety. Um, we maintain active memberships in NINA, APCO, ENA, the Next Gen 911 Institute. Um, our public safety folks are ENPs. We sit on various work groups, the MLTS model legislation, the ESI network, MG911 additional data, transition plans. Uh, I sit on the APCO Standards Development Committee. I'm on the NINA Institute Board. Uh, Standards Development Committee, Emerging, Emerging Technology Committee over in Europe. I'm the Vice Chair of the Next Generation 112 Standards Committee. So my role in Avaya is to maintain the pulse on the industry and make sure that we're developing the technology that lets you folks do your job um, a little bit better. So to sum it up, really demographics and behaviors are changing today. We have to adapt to how we're handling public safety. Routing of information is the critical piece in a peace app, understanding this new additional data flow and getting it to the first responders. And the current and emerging technologies are here to enhance public safety today with what you're doing once you get off that legacy network.